like you got an extra hour of sleep last night at all actually I think we should do that every week we should have an extra hour every Saturday night and just let it roll around wouldn't that be great Whew, tough crowd this morning all right yeah well, we could do that too that'd be good all right hey listen we are glad you're here Jody is not with us today he is at the celebration of his only grandchild's first birthday, which is a very appropriate place to be, I think. Amen? Amen? But in his place, we have a good friend of ours, Scott Sager. Scott is the, one of the vice presidents of church relations for David Lipscomb University, uh, teaches also at Lipscomb, teaches Bible there. He is also preaching now for the Granny White Church of Christ um, there close to the campus, and so uh, we're really glad to have Scott back with us. If you don't know, if you've only been here for a short time, Scott worked with us during an interim time about a year and a half ago when we did not have a preacher before we uh, got Jody to come. And so he's been a real blessing to the church for a long time. Anyway, we're glad that you're here and hope that you enjoy your time together with us this morning as we worship. If you would, just take another minute and stand and greet someone around you and we'll continue in just a second. Let 
us go as a light to the nations. Let us go as a light to the nations. Let us go as a light to the nations. Let the people sing Alleluia. Let the people sing Alleluia. Let the people sing Alleluia. Let the people sing Amen, Amen. Let us go as a light to the nations. Let the people sing Alleluia. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name I know. Sing that wonderful name of Jesus. Sing that wonderful name of Jesus. Sing that wonderful name of Jesus. share from Acts 16 this morning. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Let's take our offering. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come follow me. We see where thy footprints falling, lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. If they lead through the temple, Yeah. 
restores our faith in God. What reveals the Father's love? What can lead the wayward home? What can melt a heart of stone? What can free the guilty ones? What can save the And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God and is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat or drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, 
which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles chase after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We are about to partake of the Lord's Supper. And the reason I quoted for you a portion of Romans 8 and part of Romans 6 is as we take those emblems, I want you to taste the manifold goodness of God. I want you to feel the weight and the glory of a God who would give His very Son on a cross to justify you so that there is no one left to condemn. As the world presses in on you and you face persecution and troubles and tribulations, as hopefully some of us go to the nation to give our lives for this Savior, I want you to feel His presence in that and His awesome power to take what Satan intends for evil and to give it good, holy, eternal wonder and power. I want you to taste in this bread and this cup a God whose love for you is so extravagant that He is not content to make you wait for heaven to taste it, but offers it in the here and now so you need not worry where your bread and where your clothes come from. But He comes down into your life and says, I am here to provide for you. So whether you're a a dude working a job that's just not going well, or a busy mom who wonders whether she's mom enough, or just a young person trying to find your way, God says, my son I gave for you on the cross. And if I feed the birds of the air, know that I will feed and I will care for you. So you need not worry. While the rest of our world frets and froths over what comes on Tuesday, we need not be anxious. Because we serve a God who holds Tuesday in His hand. And that same God holds you and I in His hand. Let's pray. Father, as we take this bread, we trust in your goodness and remember your grace. We trust in the goodness of God who justifies us from all our sins so that there is no one left to condemn us. We trust in the goodness of God who overcomes all our calamities and holds us fast through them, who will never leave or abandon us. A God who is so great and so powerful that no power in heaven or on earth can separate us from your love. Father, we take this bread and we remember a God who gave himself on a tree some 2,000 years ago to remind us that we don't have to worry about where our next meal's coming from because that God has provided for our greatest need. It's in the name of your Son we pray. Amen.
One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body of Christ. And to this we give our lives to see you glorified. One heart, one spirit, one believe that there really was a Jewish carpenter and rabbi who really did die some 2,000 years ago. And we believe that at that moment is the moment upon which all of history turns because that man was not simply a man, but he was also God. And we believe that because of what was done there, that we broken and twisted and bent as we are, are now made holy and righteous and sons of the God of heaven, daughters of the king of the universe. And because of what was done there, we can enter your gates and your courts with joy. And in your presence, we can find fullness of joy and at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. For that grace, for that mercy, we praise your name as we take this cup. In Christ's name, amen. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. 
We are the body of Christ, and to this we give our lives to see. set your rule and reign in our hearts again increase in us we pray unveil while we're made come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls holy spirit come invade us now we are your church power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives. For your our joy and prize. To see the captive's hearts released. The hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray, unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop, your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Away the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land, set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear, show your mighty streets and land set your church on fire win this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here we pray be seated amen wow that was great it's good to be with you this morning. My name is Scott Sager, and I'm delighted to be here from Nashville. And Huntsville is my second home. I love it here, and I'm always honored when you guys invite me back. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 16. We'll be there in just a moment. But you'll notice I titled the lesson this morning, Go 256, which is, of course, what I did last night uh, when I drove down here to your area uh, so that we could think about what does it mean to build the kingdom here? What does it mean to see the kingdom unleashed here? And isn't that what we pray for and then out from here? 
uh, to the rest of the world. You remember in the book of Acts that when Jesus had been on this earth 40 days after the resurrection, he gathered his disciples, and before he left, he told them this as the key verse of all of the book of Acts. He says, you will be my witnesses when you receive the Holy Spirit. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And what we see happening in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost is the Holy Spirit coming in fire and in wind and enveloping the apostles so that they preach the gospel. And sure enough, just as Jesus had said, the kingdom comes to Jerusalem in a powerful way. And then out from there to the rest of the world. And what we long for is to see the Spirit unleashed so that folks like us are seeing revival happen in Area 256, our area code, where we're concerned about what is God doing right here. We're concerned about missions. We're concerned about what's happening around the world But we know that there are people coming in every day who long to know about the Christ that we have. And so I wanted us to just kind of journey with Paul for a moment this morning and think through what would it be like to approach our area like Paul would approach an area that he would enter. And that kind of segues us into Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, I think if you look at this next slide... We read this together, and uh, whoever read it, you did a great job with all those names, right, of those cities. But, you know, you got Paul, and he's on his second missionary journey, and he knows that God has called him, and he's left Antioch, and he's headed through what is modern-day Turkey. And as he's headed through Turkey, he thinks he knows what God wants him to do. Do you ever feel that way, where you're pretty confident that you know what God wants you to do? Paul feels that way. I know where he wants me to go. I feel it. I feel it. And so they're in the region of Phrygia and Galatia, right in the middle of Turkey. But the Holy Spirit is keeping them from preaching in the province of Asia. And so they go on to Mysia, and they can't do anything there. And they go to Bithynia, but the Spirit won't let them go there. And so now they find themselves venturing all the way across Turkey, and they're totally confused because... I thought we're on a mission trip, and everywhere we try to go, we just bump up, and God won't let us go. And so Paul's confused. Look at this next slide. It might help put it in perspective for you. He's traveling across Turkey, and he keeps wanting to go up and right, up and right. And he's convinced that this is what God wants him to do. And yet he keeps bumping into roadblocks every step of the way. And that brings us to big point number one, I think, on the next slide. God's mission for us may surprise us because sometimes God has to close doors to get us on mission. Have you ever wondered why you didn't get that slot that you wanted at school? You know, you wanted to be a cheerleader or you wanted a role in the musical or you wanted to make the debate team or there was something that you wanted to do and you thought you were good enough and you figured it would work and it just doesn't happen. Or you've got this job and you lose it and you wonder, what is God doing and why is this happening? Sometimes God closes doors so that he can focus us where we can be most productive. And Paul was experiencing this. He was experiencing the realization that sometimes God closes doors so that we can be most productive for his kingdom. And so he ends up in a place called Troas, which is another name for Troy. You remember the Trojan horse? That's where he ended up. And during the night, he had this vision. Next slide. During the night, he had a vision while he was sleeping, I think, of a Macedonian standing there saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, we got up to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel. If you were in my story of the church class next semester, this verse would be important. And you'd wonder, why is this verse important? 
Can you see it? Any of you? If you were in my class, you would have to notice, by the way, that the pronouns changed right here. This is where Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, actually joins the story in Troas. He becomes a traveling partner of Paul. And they have this vision of this one saying, come to Macedonia. Paul thought God wanted him in Turkey. He thought he wanted him there. And God was saying, it's time to go to Europe. It's time to take the gospel to Europe. I want you to look across the seas and realize that that's where I want you to go. Next slide. So sometimes to get back on mission, we also maybe need to take a nap. That's what Paul did. But what he was really doing was slowing down so God could tell him what he wanted him to do. You know, sometimes we need to go for a walk. We need to slow down. We need to ask, God, what's your mission? What is it that you want me to do with the few years I have on this life, on, on this earth? How do you want me to use the time and the talent, the treasures that I have? And Paul finally slowed down enough for God to say, this is where I want you. And so this is a picture of the Macedonian call. And you can see Paul's kind of taking a nap when the Macedonian says, hey, come over here. We want you. And so Paul woke up and deduced that's where we're supposed to go. So they started across the sea. Next picture. I think, yeah, so from Troas we sailed straight to Samothrace, Neapolis, and then we came to, Mas to Philippi. Philippi, a Roman colony, the leading in the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. So here's a little picture of this map going across the water, headed across the ocean by Samothrace, to Neapolis, and then he's going to walk into Philippi. And because I took my family and we went on this trip back in March, I wanted you to see a little bit of this. This is Samothrace today. Next picture is the port in Neapolis. And then the next picture is a monument that they have there in Neapolis. And I want you to notice it for just a minute because it's a mosaic that has uh, Paul both having a Macedonian vision, and then setting foot for the first time on European soil. And if you can see right down here in the right-hand corner, there's a rock right there. And that was the port at the time of Paul. And so you know what you can do, right? Ooh. I just put my foot where Paul put his foot. And so everybody wants to go and to put their foot where Paul put his foot. And I asked our group, I said, okay, here's the question, back. Uh, here's the question. How did Paul put his foot down? You see, the difference is, is that when I went, I went as a tourist. When Paul went, he went on mission. Everywhere he went, he was claiming ground for the kingdom of God. And see, so you guys have an option tomorrow. I can go to school, if you have school tomorrow, as a student. But I can go there also as a student ambassador for Christ. And I can claim ground for the kingdom of God. And those of us who work, we can walk into our offices and we can claim the ground for the kingdom of God. And those of us who go to the same Starbucks every day, we can show up not just to grab our coffee, but to start making a mark for the kingdom of God. Some of us are mall walkers, and we can walk at the mall, or we can walk the mall as an ambassador for Christ. And you see, for most of us, we aren't putting our foot down the way that Paul put his foot down. We're not walking the neighborhood thinking we're, there's a divine appointment. God wants us to bump into somebody. We're just walking. We're just going to the gym and working out and not thinking God may have somebody he wants us to meet. You know, if you work for Chick-fil-A, there's a video that they make you watch. And it has people walking up to the counter to order, and it has a little caption over their head. So an old man comes up to the counter and he's about to order. And over his head it says, lost his wife this week. First time he's ever ordered coffee for one. A little girl walks up to the counter. Lost her cat this week. 
And you begin to realize that every day God is bringing people across our path so that we can just bump into them. They're divine appointments, and yet so many times we're not setting our foot down as an ambassador. We're setting our foot down as a tourist, as somebody who's in a hurry, instead of realizing that we need to claim the ground that we walk on for God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done through us in, on earth as it is in heaven. So, Paul arrives in Philippi. Next picture. Uh, he's on the road to Philippi. It's not that far of a walk. And as he's walking along, I think we begin to realize something else. He's on a road called the Via Ignatia, or the Ignatian Way. And because of the Pax Romana, the Roman peace and the Roman roads, the, ro the road system was set up really well. But here's what's fascinating. If you read through the book of Acts and the letters of Paul, what you will discover is that the gathering of believers in Christ, much more than they were ever called the church of Christ, you know what they were called? Look at the next slide. They were called followers of the way. The way. It was a movement that we were a part of. It was this understanding that you're people who are going 256. You're going. You're on the way somewhere. So they would talk about themselves as the church on the way. There was the Ignatian way. There were all these Roman roads, and every one of them was called the way. But Christians were called the way because they were people that were on the move. They were out. They were doing things. Next slide. And so... Paul makes his way into Philippi, and it tells us in Acts chapter 16 that on Sabbath, he wanted to gather with other believers. He wanted to gather with like-minded people who named the name of Yahweh as their Lord. And because there was no synagogue there, there weren't ten Jewish families in the whole city, there was no synagogue. So he thought, where do people gather on Sabbath? Remember that song, I went down to the river to pray? You know where it comes from? From this text. Because it says, Paul and his companions, they went down to the river where the water would flow into the city and they knew that the Christians would be gathered there to pray and to worship. And so they arrived there. And while there, they met a woman named Lydia. Yeah, back, yeah. Uh, this is it, yeah. And... Uh, she was from Thyatira. She was a seller of purple. And she was a worshiper. And the Lord opened her heart to respond. And she and her household were baptized. And she invited them to stay in her home. The first convert in all of Europe. Lydia of Thyatira. Paul bumps into her at the water. And gets to tell her everything you've been hoping for. Everything that you've dreamed about. Every avenue of your faith has been pointing towards this moment and the coming of Christ into the world. And next slide. And so she was baptized and they have a marker there where the water runs into the city and they've built a baptistry there to remind people of Lydia and the way that she gave her life to Christ there in Philippi. But Paul wasn't done. Next picture. From there, he would have walked into the city, and because he was a tent maker, he would have felt right at home in the agora, the marketplace, the big area in the center of the town. And Paul would have found his way through there, talking to different shop owners, learning about the city, meeting the soldiers. There was even spots on the ground, I thought y'all would find this interesting, where backgammon boards were carved into the floor. And soldiers would sit and watch and play and backgammon really is that old. And so can you picture Paul saying, I got next? And sitting down with some soldiers and saying, tell me about life in Philippi. What's going on? But he began to find his way through the city. But Acts 16 tells us, next slide, that as he was walking around, there was a demon-possessed woman who began to follow him. And she followed him for a couple of days, and she would say, these men are servants of the Most High God who are teaching you the way to be saved. 
But here's the problem. It sounded like this. These men are servants of the Most High God teaching you a way to be saved. Not real helpful as a spokesmodel, was it? Plus, this woman is caught and trapped in the demonic influence. Finally, Paul just turns and he casts this spirit out of her. Now, the problem was this spirit gave her the ability to fortune tell. And she made a mint of money for her owners. And so now they're mad because their money is gone. And so they turn on Paul and say, these guys are turning the city upside down, and they deserve to be thrown into prison. Next picture. And so, uh, yeah, they threw them into prison, and here's the picture of the prison cell. This is where they would have been uh, taken, and this is where they would have been uh, tried and then thrown into prison. And Paul was placed in prison right there in Philippi. And you can go there and visit it today. But what we know about that prison cell is it was at the very back of the prison. And he and Silas had chains tied to their ankles. And they were stuck in the deepest recesses of the prison. And it was dark, and it was damp, and it was musky, and think locker room, but worse. And that's where they are. And they're surrounded by other prisoners who are trapped there as well. And it's just a dark place, except for these two guys. Because while everybody else is dark, damp, depressed, disgusting, there are two people. Can you hear them? And they're singing songs of praise to God. And they're thanking God in the midst of the prison. And everybody else is wondering, what is it about these guys that allows them to break out in song even in confinement? And you know what happens in those moments? Other people begin to say, I want what you have. The two most free people in all of Philippi were Paul and Silas. They had a freedom that came from this relationship that they had with Christ. Stephen Curtis Chapman writes, what kind of joy is this that counts it a blessing to suffer? What kind of joy is this that gives a prisoner a song? What kind of joy stares death in the face and sings songs of sweet victory? It's the song of a soul that's forgiven and free. And as they're singing, earthquake comes. The region was known for them. This earthquake began to shake the prison, and all of a sudden the chains fall off and the doors fall off their hinges. And now this prison is wide open and a prison break surely is about to occur. And the jailer who's in charge of the prison, who answers to Rome, who knows that if a prisoner escapes, it's his life for that life, he wakes up from his slumber, he sees what is happening, he realizes there's about to be an escape, and you know what he does? He does the only thing he can imagine doing. His perspective is so narrow. His understanding of reality is so tiny that all he can think of to do is to take a sword and run himself through. All around Huntsville today, there are people who are trapped in a pit that they can't see out of. And they have no hope they have no understanding of how things are ever going to get any better. And suicide is on the rise 
across our country because people are choosing a permanent solution to what is really a temporary crisis. And it's because they can't see any way out and they can't see any hope and they can't see that it's ever going to get better and they feel trapped and alone and isolated and confused. And what Paul says is what the church is supposed to say. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. Do yourself no harm. We're here for you. We'll help you. The jailer lights a torch and realizes not a single prisoner has escaped. And that night, the jailer did what he thought he was going to do, but just different. He thought he was going to take his life physically, and instead, he gave his life spiritually because he said, Paul, I want what you have. How do I get it? And Paul said, if you and your household believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be saved. And so they went, and the jailer washes the wounds of Paul And then Paul washes the jailer in the blood of the lamb. And everything changes. And here in Philippi, they've got this wonderful baptistry to commemorate that moment as well. That moment where instead of taking your life, you give your life for the sake of of the kingdom of God and out of your absolute conviction that Jesus is Lord. And so we come to this story and we begin to realize that there are divine appointments all around us just waiting to happen. And there are people who are trapped in a pit and cannot see the way out. And God is giving us a moment where we can speak hope and we can speak life to them. The magazine that I brought this time, I almost forgot to mention it, is what we've put out at Lipscomb about suicide, suicide prevention, how to help, especially among young adults, teenagers and the others. Uh, They're at both locations on your way out. But it's so important for us to stand up and with a loud voice say, don't harm yourself, we're here, we'll help. It's not as bad as you think it is, and Christ is is the answer to what you need. And so, we come to the end of this message and we begin to discover that God's calling us to go. 256. To walk our neighborhood as an ambassador, praying for the families around us. If we don't know them, we bake cookies and we go and we meet them. Shame on us if we don't know our neighbors. We should get to know them. We should be building a prayer list about our neighbors. And we should be walking. The mall, the schoolyard, the office building. Wherever it is God is calling us to go, let's go and plant our foot there as ambassadors for Christ. I have this little Fitbit. I wear it back here. Uh, and the reason that I wear it is because my wife told me to. <laughs> because at Lipscomb, uh, we get $300 on our insurance if I get enough activity during the year. And so I have to do like 10,000 steps a day in order to hit that mark and for us to get our $300. And it's so interesting that there are so many days I'll get to the end of the day and it'll be 9,200 steps. So, um, (laughs) you know, doing all this kind of stuff. We have a little miniature dachshund. I've been really tempted to clip it on his collar and see if those little, (laughs) little steps count, you know. But I'm just trying to get to my 10,000 steps. And I realize, you know what? I'm more concerned about getting my steps than what I'm doing with them. Because what's really important 
is what am I doing with my steps? Am I claiming crown, ground for God? Am I meeting people? I believe that divine coincidences happen and that God's providence is unleashed if I would just go and begin to make myself available to my neighbors and get to know them. That's what God is calling us to do, is to use our steps to make a difference in the world. It changed the life of Lydia, it changed the life of a jailer, it changed the life of Europe, and from Europe it changed the world. But it all began with somebody going and using their steps to make a difference for the kingdom of God. And if you haven't given your life to Christ, this baptistry reminds us of the one right behind us. If you have, but you've fallen away, or you've strayed, or you just want the prayers of the church, however we can encourage you this morning, we ask you to come as we stand and sing this song together. Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In his we lived and died. You broke the chains. You rose to life. You are the hope living in us. You are the rock in whom we trust. You are the light shining for all the world to see. You rose from the dead, conquering fear. Our Prince of Peace, drawing us near. Jesus, our hope, living for all who will receive. Lord, we Comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope on earth. Jesus, light in the darkness. Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In history, you lived and died. You broke the chains. You rose to life. You are the hope living in us. You are the rock in whom we trust. You are the light shining for all the world to see. You rose from the dead, conquering fear. Our Prince of Peace drawing us near. Jesus, our hope, living for all who will. Lord, we believe, Lord, we believe, Lord, we believe. Great to have Scott with us, amen? Amen. amen. Always, Scott, thank you very much. Uh, two things as we close. The first one is Gene and Barbara Korfman have a brand new great grandson which they're very happy about. Unfortunately, the baby is in NICU with a collapsed lung and several other issues, so they've asked us to keep him in our prayers, so please do that, and I'll say a word to Gina Bar Barber this week. This morning is uh, ramping up to our annual second harvest, where we provide 100, over 150 meals, Thanksgiving meals, for families in our community. Uh, two one set of two bags, a yellow and a pink, represents one meal for a family. You can take a half a meal, or you can take a whole meal, or you can take seven meals. Uh, that's just up to you, however you would like uh, to serve. So please pick those up. They're in the lobbies. They have to be back by next week. So take them, get them filled up, and bring them back, and we'll be ready to go for our annual second harvest. As always, thanks for being here. We hope you have a great day, and we will close in prayer. <coughs> Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your greatness. Father, we thank you for Jesus who restores all things. Father, thank you for blessing us with allowing us to be a part of your kingdom. Father, we pray that your spirit will guide us as we go about our daily walk in life. Father, open our eyes and help us to be able to bring glory and honor to your name and your kingdom, Father. 
Father, we're thankful for the food, the clothing and shelter that you provide to us. Thank you for your kindness towards us, Father. Uh, a lot of people are worried about the election coming up. And Father, we, just, we take hope and comfort that you are still sovereign, that you still sit on the throne, Father, and all praise and glory and honor belongs to your name. Father, pray that you will bless Scott and his family as they continue work in your, in your kingdom. I pray that you'll grant him safe travel back to Nashville. In Christ's name we pray, amen.